count those looking to the living God. I'm ready for a real revival. Holy Spirit, come, rock of blood, rock of fire. Holy Spirit, fall in this place, fill our hearts. Holy Spirit, come, rock of blood, rock of fire. Holy Spirit, come. I was going to get that one out. Been a long night, but it's fun to praise Jesus. It is fun to praise Jesus. We uh, got in here this morning and we sounded like a bunch of cats sitting on a fence post hollering. But we're going to put it all on Billy this morning. We're going to let him sing everything. <laughs> uh, but uh, real quick, we uh, we never know. We never know what the service is gonna gonna hold. So, just uh, to get something out there real quick, that if and I pray we do, if we have another service like we had last Sunday, I'm all for it. But any time doesn't have to be today, doesn't have to be next week. Any time that anything ever happens to where we go longer, God's not on a time limit. We're on God's time. This is not our time. Cracker Barrel can wait. You know. Should eat breakfast this morning if you get hungry by noon. But uh, any time that you ever feel like you have to get up and go, just go. It's fine. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. This altar is always open. It never closes. Isaiah said it last night. You know, if you 
you come and, and you want me to pray with you, you want me to help lead you to the Lord, I'll put my guitar down and I'll do that. It'd be an honor. If you're here this morning, you're lost. Find me, find Isaiah, Travis. We got Sean and, and Ryan back there at the live table. There's always an option. It doesn't matter if the music's going, if Isaiah's preaching, whatever. When it's time to do business with the Lord, do it. Do it then. Don't hesitate. But you know, we, we've been praying for us to be revived. And I think it's time. We serve a great God, amen? We serve a great God. I don't know about you all, but when I left here Sunday, I have been pumped all week long. That, that comes with, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Challenges in its own, because Satan has worked overtime on me this week. We have, he, he blacked Lydia's eye yesterday. <laughs> it's, been, it's been rough, but you know what? We serve a good God. We serve a God that'll never put any more on us than we can handle. We serve a God that knows the outcome of every situation that we may ever face. We serve a God that loved His Son, loved us so much that He sent His Son to die on the cross for our sins. That's an amazing God. And we're getting ready to sing a song. We've sung it before. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Because without the shedding of blood, there'd be no remission of sins. And we all sin. The Bible says that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But we have a God that loves us so much, He, he forgives us of those sins. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, let me encourage you, do not leave that way today. The time is now. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not guaranteed our next breath. We're not guaranteed our next heartbeat. And I've said this a hundred times, that we are one heartbeat away from eternity. And it's up to us to where we spend that eternity. But as I said just a minute ago, we have a God that loved us so much, He gave us an option. He gave us an option that we can live with Him in heaven if we accept His Son, Jesus. So if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, please don't leave that way today. Let's bow and let's have a word of prayer. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, as we humbly bow in your presence, Lord, we just want to thank you for all the wonderful blessings you've given us. Lord, just thank you for, for blessing us with another day of life, Father. Lord, thank you for your Son, Jesus. Lord, thank you that you allow us to come to a place like this that we can just worship you. Lord, we just pray that you be with this service. Lord, be with each and every single one that's here this morning, Father. Father, I pray that there, every single person sitting in this room this morning, Lord, has made that decision to follow your Son, Jesus Christ, and accepted him into his heart. But if there's not, Father, Lord, I just pray that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, it's so easy. It's free. It's a price that's been paid, Father, that we can never repay. But you loved us so much that you sent your Son to die for us. Lord, be with Brother Isaiah. Give him the words you'd have him to say. Hide him behind the cross, Lord. Father, most of all, anything that's said and done here today be for your honor and glory. We love you. We praise you. It's our last name I pray. Amen.
gave your life for mine Nailed to the cross You crucified All my sin and shame Is washed by your mercy You are the treasure I
The Word says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. Isn't it good to be in worship this morning? If you have your Bibles, take them, open them up to Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16, we're going to continue the series this morning when God asked the question. I love that song that Billy sang, I Am Redeemed. How many of you are redeemed this morning? I love to hear the people of God make noise because it's biblical. The Bible says, and if you don't know this verse, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. (laughs) Could have went better, but we'll we'll, we'll go with that. We'll go with that. If you're new to this series, what we're doing is instead of examining places where mankind asks God questions, we are instead flipping the script and we are looking at when God asks mankind questions. And and so we looked at Job, we've talked about Ezekiel, and uh, we're looking at and examining some questions that God asks of uh, mankind. And this morning's text and character comes from a fairly obscure character in Scripture, uh, a lady named Hagar. And before I get there, we're going to begin reading Genesis 16 in just a moment, but before I get there, I need to give you some background and some context uh, as to where we're going uh, this morning and how Hagar comes into the picture. And so Genesis chapter 12 uh, tells us uh, that Abram and Sarah, where they're staying, there was a famine in the land. And they actually leave there and they go to Egypt. Uh, because Egypt was a superpower of the day, and I guess word on the street was they had food. And so to sustain and to get what they needed for survival, uh, they leave their land and they travel uh, to this land of Egypt. And as they're traveling, while they're on their way, and we got to understand in antiquity, and especially in the Old Testament, customs were, I know this may come as a shock, but it's different than the Western world that we live in today. And, and so Abram and Sarah begin to talk, and they kind of concoct this plan. And Abram tells his wife, Sarah, he basically says this, and you can go back and read the account. He says, listen, you are a very beautiful woman, and because you are so beautiful, I have the fear that Pharaoh and the, and the court officials in Egypt, they may want to take you to be your wife, and if they find out that I'm your husband, then they may have me killed so they can take you to be their wife. He says, so what we're going to do is instead of actually telling them the truth, we are going to concord this plan that says you are my sister. Okay? And that way, uh, because of the way that things were, they will, they will actually be very nice to me and respectful to me and give me all these gifts and stuff, hoping to win your hand in marriage as opposed to looking at me like competition. And so they go, and this is exactly what they do. Uh, they, they promote this lie uh, that Sarah is actually Abraham's sister. And when this happens, God brings great disease upon Pharaoh's house and upon his court and, and basically then tells Abram, like, ask the question, like, why did you do this? Like, please leave. And Abram is kicked out of Egypt and Pharaoh gives him a lot of gifts and supplies and even some slaves in order to leave. Now, it turns out God isn't a big fan of deceit, manipulation, and lies. Shocking, I know. And as you read through this text, though, it would almost appear that, like, there's no consequence for Abraham. Like, well, he did this, and obviously God brought, but that wasn't really a consequence. But you fast forward a little bit further. And God makes Abram this covenant. And he changes his name from Abram to Abraham. And he says, you are going to have a child with your wife. It's going to be a son of promise. And he enters into this covenant and says, Abram, from your lineage, from your line, will become a mighty and a great nation. And some time goes by. And this, I told you the first story because that is apparently where Hagar comes into the picture. She is Sarah's handmaid. She is her slave. And so that wasn't the last bad idea that Abraham and Sarah would come up with. The the next one may be even worse. And so uh, some time goes by, and Abraham and Sarah begin to doubt God's promise, because that's what we do as humans. And, And they feel like maybe that God maybe either A, forgot, because 
God forgets his promises, I guess. Or B, maybe God needs some help. And because the Bible says that Abraham had great faith and it was counted in the righteousness and we know his faith and he was called the friend of God, I, I don't tend to believe that it was A and, and more I believe that it was B. And so they think they need to help God. And so Sarah comes to Abram and he, she says this. She says, I've got this idea. Why don't, I've got this plan. Why don't you go have relations with, is that delicate enough? Hagar, my handmaid, and we can maybe have a child through her and you, and we'll just kind of help God. And then things get a little crazier. Because once Hagar realizes she's pregnant, she goes from slave girl to kind of a prominent position of the house. And I know this might not come as a very big shock to anybody, but a little bit of jealousy gets into the equation. Isn't that weird? And so that brings us to Genesis chapter 16. If you're there in your Bible, say amen. Stand with me as we honor the reading of the Word of God. We're going to read verse number 5 down through verse number 8. Because the rest of the story is Sarah then begins to deal very harshly with Hagar and she runs away. Then Sarah said to Abram, my wrong be upon you. <laughs> Men, you've heard this before. This is your fault. I gave my maid into your embrace and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. So Abram said to Sarah, Indeed, your maid is in your hands. Do to her as you please. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from? And where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your presence that we feel in this place. Lord, I pray that this morning that you would do what we cannot. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see you. Open eyes. Lord, help us to do business with you. I pray that you would con comfort, that you would convict, that it would be your voice that's heard and not mine. But Lord, I pray that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your word this morning. Save souls, change lives, and Lord, hear the cry of your people. We love you. We thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray and ask all these things. Amen. You may be seated. So God appears to Hagar. And he asked two questions, and these are, the, these are the ones that I want to deal with first. The first question that he asks her is, where have you been? Where have you been? And I think that if you're Hagar in this moment, I think that probably the answer is a lot of confusion. I think the answer is a lot of hurt. I think the if, if we inflect in this text and we put ourselves there, she might be uttering phrases like, I didn't ask for this. I didn't see this coming. I was fine in my homeland of Egypt. I didn't ask to come here. I didn't ask for what happened to me. But she's so hurt and she's so distraught that she has actually ran away. And so when God asks her, where have you been? She says, I am fleeing. I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah. I think she may feel like nobody cares. That nobody knows what she's feeling. That nobody understands what it is that she's going through. And I think that it's here that we probably need to drop anchor a minute. And while you might not be able to identify with Hagar's exact situation, 
I think there are seasons in our lives to where we may echo some of the same sentiments. That of hurt. That of uncertainty. That of stress. That of pain. And the Bible says here that God asks her, where are you? Where have you been? She says, I'm running away. It's her past. And what she can't see yet is where she's going. That's the second question. And so if you go back to Genesis 16, and I I challenge you to do this. The text we read, God asked two questions, only one of which she answers. Where have you been, Hagar? I'm running away from Sarah. Where are you going? She never even answers. Because she doesn't know. The Bible says that she is in this place called Shur. It literally translates a a vast wilderness or literally walls of wilderness. She doesn't know where she is. She's in a place where she's so hurt, running away from this situation. And I, I thought, maybe... There's some truth here that we need to get a hold of because I think that probably in 2023 there may be some people that are so paralyzed by their past. They're so focused on where they've been or where they're coming from that they cannot see where they're going. Could it be that there are people that are still so polarized and paralyzed by their past and and what they've done and where they've been that they can't see what God is doing and they can't see what's right in front of their face. And it's here, it's here after this encounter with the Lord that Hagar recognizes, wow, nobody else sees where I am. And and if you're a note taker, write this down. You want some irony in the Bible? Not only is Hagar running, but she is living up to her identity. The very name Hagar means flight or to run. Can I preach this to you? You may not know where you're at. Nobody else may know what you're going through. But God does. He's the God who sees. This is what Hagar says. You are El Roe. I'm naming this place El Roe. The God who sees. And what I'm preaching to you this morning is that nobody else on planet earth may know that you're lost. But God does. He sees your lost condition. Nobody else in the world may know that hurt that you're carrying around. But God does. He's the God that sees that hurt. No matter what's going on in your life. No matter where you are, you may be exactly like Hagar. I don't know where I'm at. I don't know what God is doing. I challenge you today. Pray that prayer. God, open up my eyes. Show me what you're doing. Show me where I'm at. Well, I'm thankful for a God who sees. Not only the condition of my heart, but I'm thankful that, that you know, so many times as a, as a dad, as a parent, it's like, am I the only one in here that worries about my kids sometimes, oftentimes, every day, a lot, probably more than I should? I can't be with them 24 hours a day. There are many people that attend this church, this, this local body, this ecclesia, the church, and they're like family to me. And I, I know about some of their struggles. And I know about some of them. I know some of the things that are going on. And I can't be with them 24-7. And extended family members. In fact, I can't be with them. But I'm thankful that I can talk to a God and I can petition His throne room at any time. And I say, God, I don't know where they're at right now. I don't know what they're doing. But you are the God who sees. And Lord, your hand can be upon them. Lord, watch over them. The Bible declares that the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. He sees my comings and my goings. You may be in the similar plight this morning, but I also want to preach this. Not only does God know where you're at, not only does God know what you're dealing with, not only does God see you, you can't run from Him. (laughs) I want you to see this. Hagar has no idea where she is. 
but God does. She has no idea where she's going, (laughs) but God does. She might not even know in this moment what she needs, but God does. The second time, there's a similar account, and I want to show you this. Verse 13 of Genesis chapter 16. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, I have also here seen him who sees me. I'm thankful for a God that sees, aren't you, church? But then there's a second question. And these accounts are so similar. It's, it's hard not to notice their similarities. And a little context on this. Hagar would have the baby. She would go back to Abraham and Sarah. This was the command of the Lord. Return. Return. And stop running and return. So she would have a child named Ishmael. And God also gave them a promise. He's going to be the father of a great nation too. And if you were wondering earlier about the character of God, and man, it it kind of seemed like Abraham, (laughs) Father Abraham of Israel, seems like he, he got off pretty easy for all the deception and manipulation and deceit about telling everyone that his wife was indeed his sister. But if he hadn't have done that and they hadn't have gone to Egypt then Hagar would never be in the picture. And Ishmael would never be born because Sarah wouldn't have had that grandiose plan. But if you study this out, what you find is that Ishmael becomes the father of the Ishmaelites. You know this as the Arab nation. And if you know anything about the world landscape and politics, you know that still to this day, Israel... Abraham's people, amen, church, still have issues with the Ishmaelites. That's his consequence. The only thing harder than waiting on God is wishing you would have. And when God tells you something, we do well to believe it. When we get ahead of God, when we decide that we know better than God, the only thing at the end of that rainbow isn't a pot of gold, but despair A lot of trouble, suffering, and sometimes generational at that. So the Bible says this, that Ishmael grows, but then God, because he's a God of his word, because he does not lie, when he enters into a covenant and when he makes a commitment to somebody and when he gives his word and when he gives his promise, he honors it. And so sure enough, even in their old age, Sarah conceives and she has a son named Isaac. And what we're about to read is Genesis chapter 21. And now the Bible is going to paint us this picture that as Isaac, still being small, is weaned, that there comes this day when Abraham is going to throw this massive feast. And during this feast, Sarah sees Ishmael mocking Isaac. And you're probably not going to be shocked to learn this does not go well. Okay? I want to read Genesis chapter 21. We're going to read 8 through 10. The child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son. For that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son. Get rid of her. You want to see Abraham's consequence? Here it is. He has to send away his very own son because he loves his wife. For a moment, I want you to imagine Abraham's pain, his suffering, what he's getting ready to have to do, but then also for Hagar's. And this is the picture of what happens when we step outside the will of God and we get ahead of the plan of God. And so the first time Hagar ran, this time she's going to be sent. 
Now, I want you, if you can, for just a moment, to put yourself in the self-loathing and the despair that no doubt Hagar's in. She didn't ask for this. She didn't want this. She might be uttering phrases right now of it is what it is and, and probably hurting on levels that you can't even put into words. Her self-confidence evaporated, gone. She must be saying, I am literally free labor in their house. I have to do whatever they tell me to and I, they still do not want me. She is, must be feeling unloved. She must be feeling unwanted. And now is going to come the time when Abraham is going to have to pack them supplies and actually excommunicate them, send them away at the behest of his wife. And then we come to Genesis 21, 16 through 19. And what we are about to read is the way that I closed out last week's sermon with just a little excerpt of this. The time comes when they are in the wilderness again, surrounded by desert. And the Bible says that they are in a dire situation. They have no water. The water has ran out. And Hagar, realizing how dire and how desperate the situation is, she knows that she is getting ready to die as well as her son. And so what we're about to read, the Bible says that she takes Ishmael, the child, her child, and she sets him in some bushes. And then the Bible says that she walks away. And the Bible gives us the length of that of about a, a, an archer's bow shot. So in other words, she gets out of, out of sight and out of earshot. No doubt because as any parent, and especially a mother would, they do not, she does not have any interest in watching her son die or having her son watch her die. And so we get this picture. Hagar is in one place, sobbing. Ishmael is in another place, sobbing. Let's read what the Bible says. Genesis 21, 16 through 19. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away. For she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, here's our last question. What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up, take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. And watch what happens. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy to drink. I don't know if you see what I see, but I see a God who always provides the need. I see a situation here where the provision was already there. The blessing was right in front of her. But she couldn't see it. I wonder, I wonder in 2023 with the rat race of life and all the social media and the constant scrolling on our phones, television and just day-to-day -day schedule and work, I wonder how many days pass, how many moments where the blessing of God and His goodness is right before us. But we can't see it. Hagar never forgot the first place. She named it. To the God who sees. But a few more quick little points. Number one, once again, Hagar doesn't know where she is. But God does. Let me preach this again. Nobody else may know where you're at, but God does. Number two, no one else knows how she's feeling. Besides her and Ishmael, nobody else on the entire planet knows the situation that they're in. 
the dire circumstances that they're facing. I mean, this is serious. It's a life and death situation. She feels it. But God does. And as a matter of fact, He is so vested in it that He comes to her as we would one of our children when we see them crying. And He, and he just kind of says, now they're there, Hagar. What's the matter? She doesn't even respond. Because I would be willing to bet there is no way she can even describe with words what it is that she's feeling. But God knows exactly what she needs. And He's getting ready to meet that need. Number three, God heard when no one else could. She is in a place where Ishmael can't hear her and she cannot hear the boy. But God does. I'm thankful for a God that when I don't have anybody else to talk to, or when I feel like there is no one else to talk to, He's there. Amen? Here's a promise from the Word of God today. God hears the cry of His people. No one else heard, but God did. Fourth, God opened up her eyes. And when He did, it was salvation. A well providing water. The exact need of the hour. And that's my challenge to you this morning. Is we're going to finish where we started. Christians, I ask that you pray. God, open up my eyes. Allow you to see where you're working now. Lord, help me forget those things which are behind and press on to the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Everybody has a past. That's your testimony. And allow God to get glory in it. Don't become so focused on where you've been that you cannot see where you're going. Don't become so polarized by where you've been that you can't see what God is doing. And I challenge you to pray that this morning. God, open up my eyes. Allow me to see your provision and your blessing. And then when He does, thank Him for it. But then also pray, God, open up the eyes of anybody here this morning that is lost. God, open up the eyes to their lost condition. If they're watching online, may they respond to the gospel. And I'm going to give it this morning the same way I gave it last week. Romans 10 verse 9 says that if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you'll believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10 13, for whosoever, for everyone that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I don't know where you are this morning, but God does. I don't know what you need this morning, but God does. I don't know what your eyes need to be open to today, but God does. And that's what we're going to pray this morning as we stand. I challenge you to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve Him. And all I ask, I think all that God asks is that you be obedient. If you don't know, then come and get me. Come and get Travis. Come and get Matt. We've got guys back here to my left, your right at the live table. Go back there and ask the question that the jailer asked. What do I need to do to be saved? And it would be our privilege to open up the Word of God and show you just that. Let's pray this morning. Whatever your need is this morning, you come. Father God, thank you for this day. And Lord, now I pray that you would do what we cannot. Lord, we can't open eyes, you can. Lord, I pray that you would do that this morning. Open eyes that we could see you. Lord, I pray that you would open eyes to blessings. Lord, I pray that you would open eyes to your grace. Lord, to your provision. But Lord, I pray that you would also open up eyes this morning to lost condition. Lord, help us not run away, but help us run to you. 
Lord, bless, speak, move as only you can. Lord, when you do, it's you that will give the glory and the honor for it. Bless this your church. Lord, bless this time of invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for your attention. Listen, do not leave with a need, all right? God's invitation never closes. Amen, church? And you can be saved right after a service. You can be saved during a service. You can be saved anywhere. I'm going to be back here at the uh, life table um, located in uh, this back corner over here. And uh, if you would like to speak with me, if you want more information on the church, have questions about salvation, baptism, whatever your question is, please don't leave here with it. We'd love to answer it. Be, be back there. Uh, it would be my privilege to meet with you after the service. Uh, Matt will be up here. Travis will be up here. Uh, please, if there's anything we can do or anything we can pray with you about, uh, we would love to do that today. Uh, church, uh, tell somebody about Jesus this week and invite somebody to come to worship with you next week. Amen. Uh, let's pray together. Uh, let's pray together this morning as we close. Father God, thank you for this day. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the presence uh, that we feel in this place. And Lord, we thank you for the souls saved. And Lord, you know every need that's represented here in this room. And Lord, we ask that you would meet it. Uh, Lord, we pray for an outpouring of your spirit. Lord, I pray that if there's one here today lost, Lord, help them not leave that way. Uh, Lord, you know the needs represented in this room. Meet them. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would go before us this week. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear the needs around us. And Lord, a boldness uh, to proclaim uh, your love and your word. Uh, Lord, we love you. We thank you for all you do for us. Lord, we thank you most of all for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. So come believe.